Hi boys and girls, happy Wednesday. I hope you're having a great day. Today we are reading Pippi Goes on Board Chapter 5, which is called Pippi Goes to the Fair. Let's start. Once every year, a fair was held in the little town, and all the children were simply wild with joy that anything so nice could happen. The town looked quite different on fair day. There were big crowds in the streets, flags were flying, and in the marketplace were booths where you could buy the most wonderful things. There was so much commotion that it was exciting just to walk in the streets. Best of all, down by the city gate there was a carnival with a merry-go-round and shooting galleries and a tent show and all other kinds of jolly things. And there was a menagerie, a menagerie with all sorts of wild animals, tigers, giant snakes, and monkeys and trained snake seals. You could stand outside the menagerie and hear the strangest growling and roaring you ever heard in all your life. And if you had money, you could, of course, go in and see everything, too. No wonder that even the bow in Anika's hair trembled with excitement when she had finished dressing the morning of the fair. Or that Tommy swallowed his cheese sandwich almost whole. Tommy and Anika's mother asked them if they didn't want to go to the fair with her, but they squirmed and wiggled and said if she didn't mind, they would rather go with Pippi. For you see, explained Tommy to Anika as they ran through the garden gate at Villa Vilcula, I think more fun things will happen when Pippi is around. Anika thought so too. Pippi was all dressed up and standing right in the middle of the kitchen floor waiting for them. She had at last found her big cartwheel hat in the woodshed. I forgot that I used to carry wood in the other day. I used it to carry in wood the other day, she said, and pulled the hat down over her eyes. Don't I look nice? Tommy and Anika had to admit that she did. She had blackened her eyebrows with a piece of charcoal and had painted her lips and her nails red. And then she had put on a very fine evening dress that reached to the floor. It was cut low in the back and showed her red flannel underwear. Her big black shoes stuck out from under her skirt and they were even finer than usual for she had tied them with big green rosettes she wear only on special occasions. I think one should look like a really fine lady when one goes to the fair, she said as she tip tripped down the road as daintily as possible in such big shoes. She lifted up the edge of her skirt and holding it away from her and holding it away from her and in a voice that didn't sound at all like her own. Charming, charming. What is it that's so charming? asked Tommy. Me, said Pippi happily. Tommy and Anika thought that everything was charming when there was a fair in town. It was charming to mingle with the crowd and to go from one booth to another on the square and to look at all the things displayed there. Pippi bought a red silk scarf for Anika as a souvenir of the fair and for Tommy a visor cap which he had always longed for but which his mother didn't want him to have. In another booth Pippi bought two glass bells filled with pink and white candies. Oh how kind you are Pippi said Anika hugging her bell. Oh yes Charming, said Pippi. Charming, she said, lifting her skirt and gracefully. A stream of people moved slowly down the street from the square to the carnival. Pippi, Tommy, and Anika went along. Gee, isn't this great, said Tommy. The organ grinder played, the merry-go-round went round and round, and people laughed joyously. The dart-throwing and china-breaking were in full swing, People crowded around the shooting galleries to show their skill. I'd like to look a little closer at that, said Pippi, and pulled Tommy and Anika with her to the shooting gallery. Just then, there was no one at that particular gallery, and the lady who was supposed to be handing out guns and taking in money was cross. She didn't think three children would make very good customers, so she paid no attention to them. Pippi looked at the target with great interest. It was a cardboard man with a round face dressed in a blue coat. Right in the middle of his face was a red nose, which you were supposed to hit. If you couldn't hit his nose, you should at least come close to it. 
Shots that didn't hit his face weren't counted. It annoyed the lady to see the children standing there. She wanted customers who could both shoot and pay. Are you still hanging around here? She said angrily. No, said Pippi seriously. We're sitting in the middle of the square cracking nuts. What are you glaring at? Asked the lady, still more angrily. Are you waiting for someone to come and shoot? No, said Pippi. We're waiting for you to start turning somersaults. Just then a customer came up, a very fine gentleman with a big chain over his stomach. He took a gun and weighed it in his hand. I don't think I'll take a few shots. I think I'll take a few shots just to show you how it's done, he said. He looked around to see if he had any audience, but there was no one except Pippi, Tommy, and Anika. Look here, children, he said. Watch me and I'll give you your first lesson on the art of shooting. He lifted the gun to his cheek. The first shot was way off. The second shot also. The third and the fourth, still farther from the nose. The fifth shot hit the cardboard man on the bottom of his chin. The gun's no good, said the fine gentleman and threw it down. Pippi picked it up and loaded it. My, how well you shoot, she said. Another time I'll shoot, just as you taught us, but not like this. Pang, 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 pang. Five shots had hit the cardboard man right in the middle of his nose. Pippi gave the lady a gold coin and walked off. The merry-go-round was so marvelous that Tommy and Anika held their breath in awe when they saw it. They were black and white and brown wooden horses to ride on. They had real manes and tails and looked almost alive. They also had saddles and reins. You could choose any horse you wanted. Pippi bought a whole gold coin's worth of tickets. She got so many, there was hardly room for them in her big purse. If I had given them another gold coin, I think I would have to, I would have got the whole whirling thingamajig, she said to Tommy and Anika, who stood waiting for her. Tommy decided on a black horse, and Anika took a white one. Pippi placed Mr. Nilsson on a black horse that looked very wild. Mr. Nilsson immediately began to scratch the horse's mane to see if it had any fleas. Is Mr. Nilsson going to ride the merry-go-round too? Asked Anika, surprised. Of course, said Pippi. If I'd thought about it, I would have brought my horse too. He really needed a bit of entertainment. And a horse who rides a horse? Now that would have been really horsey. Pippi threw herself into the saddle of the brown horse, and the next second the merry-go-round started and the music played. Do you remember our, ch remember our childhood days with all their jolly fun? Tommy and Anika thought it was wonderful to ride the merry-go-round, and Pippi looked as if she were enjoying herself too. She stood on her head on her horse with her legs straight up in the air. Her long evening dress fell down around her neck. The people who were watching saw only a red flannel shirt and a pair of green pants, and Pippi's long, thin legs with one black and one brown stocking, her large shoes playfully waving back and forth. That's the way a really fine lady rides the merry-go-round, exclaimed Pippi at the end of the whole ride. The children rode the merry-go-round for an entire hour, but at last Pippi was dizzy and said that she saw three merry-go-rounds instead of one. It's so hard to decide which one to ride on, she said, so I think we'll go some other place. She had a whole lot of tickets left, and these she gave to some little children who hadn't ridden at all because they didn't have any money for tickets. Outside a tent nearby, a man was shouting, New show starts in five minutes. Do not miss this wonderful op opportunity to see the mount murder of the Countess Aurora, or who's sneaking around in the bushes. Right this way, folks, right this way for the big show. If there's someone sneaking around in the bushes, we'll have to go in and find out who it is. And immediately, said Pippi to Tommy and Anika, come on. Let's go in. She walked up to the ticket window. 
Can't I go in for half price if I promise to look with just one eye? She asked with a sudden lack of economy. But the ticket seller wouldn't hear anything like that. I don't see any bushes and no one to sneak around in them either, said Pippi disgustedly when she and Tommy and Anika had seated themselves on the front bench. Well, it hasn't started yet, said Tommy. Just then the curtain went up and the Countess Aurora was seen walking back and forth on the stage. She was wringing her hands and looked worried. Pippi followed every move with breathless interest. She must feel sad, she said to Tommy and Anika. Or maybe she has a safety pin that's sticking her in some place. Countess Aurora was feeling sad. She raised her eyes to the ceiling and said in a plaintive voice, Is there anyone as unhappy as I? My children taken away from me. My husband disappeared. And I myself surrounded by villains and bandits who want to kill me. Oh, how terrible it is to hear this, said Pippi, whose eyes were getting red. I wish I was dead already, said the Countess Aurora. Pippi burst out crying. Please don't talk like that, she sniffled. Things will be brighter for you. The children will find their way home. And you can always find another husband. There are so many. She gasped between her sobs. The manager of the show, the one who stood outside, came up to Pippi and told her that if she didn't keep absolutely quiet, she would have to leave the theater at once. I'll try, said Pippi, wiping her eyes. The play was terribly exciting. Tommy sat through it, all twisting and turning his cap from sheer nervousness. Anika held her hands tightly clasped in her lap. Pippi's bright eyes didn't leave Countess Aurora for a minute. Things were growing worse and worse for the poor Countess. She walked in the palace garden, suspecting nothing. Suddenly, there was a large cry. It was Pippi. She had seen a man hiding behind a tree and he didn't look like a kind man. Countess Aurora must have heard something rustling, for she said in a frightened voice, Who's sneaking around in the bushes? I can tell you, said Pippi excitedly. It's a horrible man with a black mustache. Run into the woodshed and lock the door quickly. The manager came up to Pippi and said she would have to leave at once. And leave the Countess Aurora? Alone with that horrible man? You don't know me, mister, answered Pippi. On the stage, the play went on. Suddenly, the horrible man sprung from the bushes and threw himself at the Countess Aurora. Ha! Your last hour has come, he hissed. Oh, it has, has it? cried Pippi. We'll see about that. And with one jump, she was on the stage. Grabbing the villain around the waist, she threw him across the footlights onto the floor of the auditorium. She was still crying. How could you? she sobbed. What have you against the Countess anyway? Remember, her children and her husband have left her and she's all uh, uh, alone. <laughs> She went up to the Countess, who had sunk down on the garden seat, completely exhausted. You can come and live with me in Villa Vilcula if you want, said Pippi comfortingly. <laughs> Sobbing loudly, Pippi stumbled out of the theater, followed by Tommy and Anika, and the manager. He shook his fist after Pippi, but the people in the audience clapped their hands and thought she had given a good show. Outside, Pippi blew her nose and quickly regaining her composure said, Come, we'll have to cheer up. <sighs> that was just too sad. The menagerie, said Tommy. We haven't been to the menagerie. On their way to the menagerie, they stopped at a sandwich, sandwich stand and Pippi bought six sandwiches for each of them and three big bottles of soda pop. Crying always makes me hungry, explained Pippi. 
There were many things to see inside the menagerie, an elephant and two tigers in a cage, and several large trained seals that were throwing a ball to one another, and a whole lot of monkeys and a hyena and two giant snakes. Pippi took Mr. Nilsson over to the monkey cage so that he could speak to his relatives. An old chimpanzee sat there looking very sad. Come on, Mr. Nilsson, speak up nicely now. I imagine this is your grandfather's cousin's aunt's mother-in-law's nephew. Mr. Nilsson doffed his straw hat and spoke as politely as he knew how, but the chimpanzee didn't bother to answer. The two giant snakes lay in a big, big box. Every hour, the beautiful snake charmer, Mademoiselle Paula, took them from their box and didn't act with them on the stage. The children were lucky, for they came in just in time for the performance. Anika was so afraid of snakes that she held tightly to Pippi's arm. Mademoiselle Paula lifted one of the snakes up, a big, ugly thing, and put it around her neck like a scarf. That looks like a boa constrictor, whispered Pippi to Tommy and Anika. I wonder what kind the other is. She went over to the box and lifted up the other snake. It was still larger and uglier. Pippi put it around her neck just as Mademoiselle Paula had done. All the people in the menagerie cried out in horror. Mademoiselle Paula threw her snake into the box and rushed over to try to save Pippi from certain death. Pippi Snake was frightened and angry from the noise, and he couldn't at all understand why he should be hanging around the neck of a little red-headed girl instead of around Mademoiselle Paula's neck as he was used to doing. He decided to teach the little red-headed girl a lesson and contracted his body into a grip that would ordinarily choke an ox. Don't try that old trick on me, said Pippi. I've seen larger snakes than you, you know, in farthest India. She pulled the snake away from her throat and put him back in the box. Tommy and Danika stood there, pale with fright. Yeah, that was a bow constrictor, said Pippi, fastening one of her garters that had come loose. Just as I thought. Mademoiselle Paula scolded her for several minutes in some foreign language, and all the people in the menagerie drew a long breath in relief but their relief was short-lived, for this was evidently a day when things happened. Afterward, no one knew just how the next thing had happened. The tigers had been fed large red chunks of meat, and the keeper said he was sure he had locked the door to the cage. But a minute later, a terrible cry was heard. A tiger is loose! It was there. Outside the cage lay the yellow striped beast, ready to spring. The people fled in all directions, all but one little girl who stood squeezed into the corner, right next to the tiger. Stand perfectly still, the people called to her. They hoped the tiger would not touch her if she didn't move. What will we do? They cried, wringing their hands. Run for the police, someone suggested. Call the fire department, cried another. Bring Pippi Longstocking, cried Pippi, and stepped forward. She squatted a couple yards from the tiger and called to him. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. The tiger growled ferociously and showed his enormous teeth. Pippi held up a warning finger. If you bite me, I'll bite you, and you can be sure of that. Then this tiger sprang right at her. What's this? Don't you understand a joke? cried Pippi and pushed the tiger away. With a large snarl, with a loud snarl that made cold shivers go up and down everyone's back, the tiger threw himself at Pippi a second time. You could plainly see that he wanted to bite her throat. So you want to fight, eh? said Pippi. Well, just remember that it was you who started it. With one hand, she pressed together the huge jaws of the tiger, picked him up, and cradled him in her arms. 
she tenderly carried him back to the cage, singing a little song. Have you seen my little kitty, little kitty, little kitty? The people drew a sigh of relief for a second time, and the little girl who had stood, squeezed in the corner, ran to her mother and said she never wanted to go to the menagerie again. The tiger had torn the hem of Pippi's dress. Pippi looked at the rags and said, Does anyone have a pair of scissors? Mademoiselle Paula had a pair, and she wasn't angry with Pippi anymore. Here you are, you brave little girl, she said, and gave Pippi the scissors. Pippi cut her dress off a few inches above the knees. There, she said. Now I'm finer than ever. My dress is cut low at the neck and high at the knees. You really couldn't find a finer dress. She tripped off so elegantly that her knees hit each other with each step. Charming, she said. You would have thought that there had been enough excitement for one day at the fair. The fairs are never very quiet places. And it was soon evident that the people had again drawn their breath of relief far too soon. In the little town lived a very bad man. A very strong bad man. All of the children were afraid of him, and not only the children, but everyone else too. Even the policemen preferred to stay out of the way when the bad man, Laban, was on the warpath. He wasn't angry at all, or he wasn't angry all the time, only when he had drunk ale, and he had had quite a bit of ale that day at the fair. Yelling and bellowing, he came down Main Street, swinging his huge arms. Out of my way, he cried, for here comes Laban. The people anxiously backed up against the walls, and many children cried in terror. There was no policeman in sight. Laban made his way toward the car carnival. He was terrible to look at with his long black hair hanging down over his forehead his big red nose, and one yellow tooth sticking out of his mouth. The crowd of the carnival thought he looked even more ferocious than a tiger. A little old man stood in a booth selling sausages. Laban went up to the booth, booth stuck his fist on the counter, and yelled, Give me a sausage, and be quick about it! The old man gave him a sausage at once. That'll be... Fifteen cents, he said timidly. Do you charge for a sausage when you serve it to such a fine gentleman as Laban? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Hand over another one. The old man did as the old man said that the first, that first he must have the money for the one Laban had already eaten. Then Laban took hold of the old man's ears and shook him. Hand over another sausage, he demanded, this instant. The old man didn't dare disobey, but the people who stood around couldn't help muttering disapprovingly. There was even one brave enough to say, it's disgraceful to treat a poor old man like that. Laban turned around. He looked at the crowd with his bloodshot eyes. Did someone sneeze? He sneered. The crowd sensed trouble and wanted to leave. Stand still, said Laban. I'll bash in the head of the first one who moves. Stand still, I say, for Laban will now give a little show. He took a whole handful of sausages and began to juggle them. He threw them into the air and caught some of them in his mouth and some in his hands, but several fell to the ground. The poor old sausage man almost cried. Suddenly, a little form darted out of the crowd. Pippi stopped right in front of Laban. Whose little boy can this be? She asked sweetly. And what will his mommy say when he throws his breakfast around like this? Laban gave a terrifying growl. Didn't I say that everyone should stand still? He shouted. Do you always turn on the loudspeaker, wondered Pippi. Laban raised a threatening fist and yelled, Silly girl, 
Do I have to make hash out of you to make you be quiet? Pippi stood with her hands at her sides and looked at him with interest. What was it you did to the sausages? Was it this? She threw Laban high up into the air and juggled him for a few minutes. The people cheered. The old man clapped his wrinkled hands and smiled. When Pippi had finished, a very much frightened and confused Laban sat on the ground looking around. Now, I think the bad man should go home, said Pippi. Laban had no objection. But before you go, there are some sausages to be paid for, said Pippi. Laban stood up and paid for 18 sausages, and then he left without a word. He was never quite himself after that day. Whew. Excuse me. Three cheers for Pippi, cried the people. Hooray for Pippi, cried Tommy and Danica. We don't need a policeman in this town, somebody said, as long as we have Pippi Longstocking. No, sir, said someone else. She takes care of both tigers and bad men. Of course we have to have a policeman, said Pippi. Someone has to see to it that the bicycles stand decently parked in the wrong places. Oh, Pippi, you were wonderful, said Anika, as the children walked home from the fair. Oh, yes, charming, said Pippi. She held up her skirt, which already came only halfway to her knees. Really, most charming. And that is the end of chapter five. So make sure you join us tomorrow for chapter six, which is Pippi is shipwrecked. We'll see you then. Bye.